Hello, uh, welcome and thank you for joining our open seminar today. Uh, my name is Jan Piasecki and before we begin our discussion, I would like to briefly introduce our project and of course our guests. So the web immunization project is focused on resilience against online misinformation. Our team consists of researchers from my Institute of Pharmacology, Polish Academy of Sciences, Poznan University of Technology, Jagiellonian University Medical College and University of Oslo. We received uh, funding from EEA financial mechanism in the Idea Lab call operated by the National Science Center in Poland. And you can find more information uh, about our project on our website, on Twitter and, uh, and Facebook at Web Immunization, as well as on our YouTube channel. The seminar is also being recorded and will be available later on on our YouTube channel. So um, today uh, we are in Oslo and Jonas comes from the Department of Psychology of uh, the University of Oslo will be the host and the moderator of today's seminar. After that, you can submit your questions in chat or you can raise your virtual, not physical, but the virtual hand and Jonas will take your uh, questions. And our guest today is uh, John Rosenbeck, who will be speaking about how to counter misinformation using psychology. John Rosenbeck is the British Academy Postdoctoral Fellow at the Cambridge Social Decision Making Lab. His research focuses on misinformation, vaccine hesitancy, online extremism and inoculation theory. As a part of his research, he co-developed the award-winning fake news games, Bad News, Harmony Square and Go Viral. John is also interested in social media research, agent-based modeling, and natural language processing. His doctoral dissertation uh, in 2020 examined media discourse in conflict zones primarily in the so-called People's Republic of Donetsk and Luhansk in eastern Ukraine. So uh, welcome John and please take our virtual uh, stage. Thank you so much Jan and thank you Jonas for the invitation and everyone else as well. Very happy to be here. Um, let me share my screen just a second. There we are. How's this? Visible, yes? Uh, is that a yes? <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll be talking for about, I guess, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible because I'm very interested also in hearing everyone's thoughts and ideas. Um, and also uh, how to apply some of these insights, for example, within the conflict in Ukraine. As Jan mentioned earlier, my PhD was about the war in Ukraine between the media discourse in the war in Ukraine between 2014 and 2017-18. Um, and so, of course, this is a very, I guess, personal and personally important issue for me. So I'm curious as to your thoughts in that direction for sure at the end. But for now, um, here we are. <laughs> um, this is sort of the structure of the talk. And uh, the reason I've structured it this way is because um, I want to get to the inoculation stuff and what to do about misinformation sort of at the end. But before I do, um, I think it's important to, to talk a little bit about sort of the philosophical, I guess, or epistemic approach to tackling misinformation. I use the word misinformation uh, for deliberate reason and never fake news or disinformation uh, or rarely. Um, because I think that there's some interesting thoughts to be had about what to do about the problem depending on how you see the problem, right? And then, of course, there's also the interesting question about whether we even have a problem, right? And I think 
the intuitive answer to that is yes. Uh, there's also some people who are saying, well, we kind of don't, which is an interesting thing to think about and something worth taking seriously. And then also, what? why do people fall for misinformation? Right? Uh, meaning the, if we can, we have a pretty good idea of what the factors are that make people vulnerable to falling for misinformation, then uh, that informs our design decisions when it comes to interventions, et cetera, et cetera. So, all of that will lead up to my the, the final part of the talk that relates to uh, the solutions. And so I'll briefly discuss sort of fact checking, uh, debunking and pre-bunking, and then the idea behind inoculation. OK. So. You hear the word fake news a lot, or at least I guess you used to. It's not as common now as it was, let's say, three, four or five years ago. Uh, but this I thought was an excellent example of fake news. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this story. I'm sure most of you know The Onion, which is a satirical outlet in the United States, so they make joke articles. And the reason I mentioned this article is, well, number one, it's hilarious, but number two, um, some Chinese propaganda outlet thought this was real, which was amazing. So they actually thought that this was a real news story, so they, they, they copy-pasted it onto their website along with a collage of pictures of Kim Jong-un on his horse and Kim Jong-un looking, you know, beefy and all that, um, which I thought was awesome because for me, what this shows is, okay, yeah, sure, it's a fake news story, but there's no harm done whatsoever, right? Point being, just because it's false doesn't mean we should want to do something about it. Satire is a really good example of false stories or oftentimes false stories that we don't think as harmful simply because of the fault. This, however, is a different story, right? And so I think this is a very interesting example. This is a Facebook post by some guy named Quinn Cinco in some Facebook group for some area of Brooklyn. And he's very upset if you look at the angry emoji. Um, and he's upset because he thinks that these women are protesting to end Father's Day, right? Meaning it plays into a prior about, well, discourse that's tragically fairly common on the internet about um, feminism having gone too far, feminists having become very extreme and so on and so on to the point where they even seek to take away, um, you know, a simple joy like Father's Day, right? now. The thing to note here is this is uh, if you can maybe you can't tell because it's too far away, but from close up, it's pretty obvious this is photoshopped, right? This isn't a real protest. They were protesting something else. It doesn't really matter what, but someone photoshopped this in with a clear goal to upset people and make them think that uh, feminism has gone too far, right? So it's not like the, the point like this. I think that you can describe this as fake news with some accuracy. But it's clearly qualitatively very different from the previous story, right? Which is, doesn't do any harm whatsoever. But here, what you get is you evoke a reaction that is very emotional, but also based on false information. Meaning you're, you think that there is an actual contingent of people large enough to stage a protest that is so extreme that they think Father's Day shouldn't exist, right? So, that gets to the point of when we talk about something like falsehoods, right? You need to qualify what you mean by falsehood, meaning is it a harmful falsehood? Is it not a harmful falsehood, et cetera, et cetera, right? What kind of falsehood is, is, is being, being promoted? Now, that's all well and good, but that's not the only thing that we're dealing with. So this, is, this happened a couple months ago. This was March 4th, an article in The Guardian. Um, very, very interesting story that we're trying to explore a little bit um, with some colleagues to see the extent to which this is the case. But what you saw here was there's a lot of bots on, let's say, Twitter and other social media outlets that were spreading misinformation about COVID-19. Just, just low quality and or false and or misleading information about the virus and the vaccine, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when February 24th happened and, and Russia invaded Ukraine, um, 
All of a sudden, those bots went silent, and a few days later, they popped back up and started talking about Ukraine. And so, for me, what this means is there is a component to this that is inorganic, right? We don't exactly know how large that component is, but it's important to note because it appears to be the case that a lot of the misinformation and the disinformation is, is not only sort of artificially propped up by bots, which are, I don't know, presumably backed by some state entity. Um, it's not only that we have that, but it's even content agnostic, right? Like you think, like why would, let's assume that this is measurably true, right? I don't know exactly if that's the case, but let's assume that uh, the Russian government has been running bot accounts that spread COVID misinformation that then pivoted to Ukraine. Then that tells us that these, these people who are mounting these disinformation campaigns, they don't really care about what they talk about necessarily, or they do care, but only to a certain extent, meaning the point of it isn't to talk the talk about a particular topic the, the point is to spread misinformation and disinformation in a general sense and whatever topic that may take on is dependent on whatever societal issue is most important at the moment right important to take into account here's another important thing i think which is this this was the most viral article on facebook of i don't know the first half of 2021 or all of 2021 doesn't matter at, least, at the very least it was shared millions and millions of times right and um, the problem with this, there's a couple of problems with this headline. Number one, every single word in this headline is true, right? All of this did happen. And the uh, outlet that published this article, which is the Chicago Tribune, is perfectly legitimate. Like it's a good outlet. It's not a, not a problematic one at all. It's a decent newspaper. However, what I think everyone can agree on is that the implication of this headline is highly problematic, meaning the reason that this was shared, I think it's safe to assume on Facebook millions and millions of times, isn't because people are like, oh, that's academically interesting. Let's uh, have a calm and reasoned discussion about whether that might be the case. No, of course not. They shared it because they thought that the doctor died because he got vaccinated, which isn't the case, or at least there's no evidence of that. Right, so the, if you re, if you look up this article, the first paragraph you see is there's no evidence that the doctor died because he got vaccinated. Right, but headline doesn't exactly reflect that doubt. So that ties into my earlier point about falsehood and veracity and so on. Falsehoods aren't necessarily the problem in and of themselves. Meaning a lot of the misinformation that we see that we can reasonably classify as misinformation, which I think that this falls under, under a reasonable definition, um, isn't incorrect information. It's misleading, decontextualized, sprinkles of truth, highly polarizing, etc., etc., etc. And that is a bit of an issue because that means that if we talk about what to do about the problem, I personally would say you can't um, define the problem as false information that people are consuming because you're missing out on a significant chunk, a really, really important part, if not the majority of the content that would be relevant to tackle. Another dimension to this problem is this, which is an article that was published by my colleagues, uh, Steve Rachey, who's a really good PhD student at our department, almost finishing. Uh, Jay van Bavel, professor at New York University and Sandra van der Linden, my colleague here in Cambridge. And what they, uh, the nice thing about publishing PNES is they make you write a title for the article that summarizes the entire article. And so what this, what they found in this study was um, the type of content that generates retweets and likes and all these kinds of things online. The, by far the strongest predictor of that is content where you're expressing outrage or anger or negative emotions about other groups. So this study was done in the US. So in a democratic echo chamber, right, or a liberal echo chamber, content that is negative about Republicans is most likely to go viral and vice versa. More so than just generally negative language, more so than positive language, more so than humor, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's a bit of an issue because 
uh, that type of content isn't necessarily conducive to accuracy. It can be, meaning sometimes it's reasonable to be negative about members of other groups, for sure, right? You have good reasons to be. But if that's a general dynamic that drives virality on social media, that plays into the misinformation debate to a large extent, I think. OK. So just to summarize, um, there's a lot of debate going on within the community of misinformation research, as, as many of you will know, about what how to define misinformation. And so this is this is sort of my perspective on this. Um, a lot of these definitions focus on veracity, meaning is is the headline that you're showing people true or false? Right. I would say the majority of research does that. Uh, but there's other definitions where you look more at intent, right? Whether determining whether something is harmful is the, uh, is decided by whether the producer is intentionally trying to seek to deceive or manipulate their audience, right? Disinformation often falls under this definition. Um, but what I would argue is in number one, if you're just sort of scrolling through your feed on Twitter, let's say, you can't um, always discern what a person means behind it, right? You don't really know if it's a Russian bot or if it's a Chinese bot or if it's an American bot. You have no real way of knowing just from looking at the content, right? So, okay, intent is important, but from a practical perspective, difficult to use. And then there's the problem with truth, which is even intentionally manipulative messages spread by dishonest actors can be true, right? Happens all the time decontextualize maybe, but true nonetheless, and seek to fuel polarization rather than spread false information. So my only point is, if we only focus on veracity as the problem, we're missing out on way too much, which is why we don't tend to do that more on that later. Um, just to, again, sort of summarize, I suppose, uh, what we tend to look at when it comes to misinformation isn't necessarily truth or falsehood, but rather can you determine whether there is a manipulation or misleadingness going on, right? So can you pick up on certain known strategies, logical fallacies, et cetera, et cetera, that are being used that would make you suspicious as to the reliability of the content, right? So there's many of these, uh, you can use emotional language or evoking like the one that I mentioned before, right? Um, conspiracies, impersonation, but also logical fallacies and so on and so on. Um, so that's more of a holistic, I suppose, or bottom-up definition of misinformation that we tend to uh, employ to a certain extent. Right, that was point number one. So that's, a, I guess, a lot of food for thought. But point number two is, okay, that's all well and good, but do we have a problem at all, right? Because some are some researchers, for instance, there's a few at Sciences Po in Paris, so Sacha Altai, Hugo Mercier, and so on, uh, Manon Beriche. And their work is super interesting. And, th and they published a preprint recently. I'm not sure in what stage of review it is. Uh, it's a very interesting point where they basically say, well, look, there aren't people aren't really exposed to misinformation all that much, right? Fake news, like very few people ever see a fake news headline, right? So uh what we should do uh, summarizing and and uh, uh, not doing justice to their argument at all it's worth reading uh what we should do rather than seeking to combat misinformation is foster engagement with reliable sources with reliable information rather than sort of trying to make sure that people disengage from misinformation etc so because simply because you're far more likely to encounter a, a, a uh, a, a useful or reliable source than you are to encounter misinformation. Now, I think that's a very interesting argument and it holds quite well, if you ask me, if you follow this definition of veracity, right? Like fact checked false content isn't that common. That's correct. Because number one, it's very difficult to fact check everything. So that the like, majority I would say of false content is never fact checked simply because of capacity. But also, um, that depends, like if you're only focusing on true versus false, that story rings much more true than if you also focus on misleading content, manipulative content, et cetera, et cetera, as I've tried to do before. So here again, 
whether we have a problem is partially contingent on your definition. Nonetheless, right, you've, I'm sure you've seen these kinds of headlines, um, meaning during COVID, uh, in Iran, people died after they drank a poisonous concoction to cure COVID. Uh, Brazil, obvious case of uh, people in high positions, such as President Bolsonaro, clearly expressing false beliefs about the virus, that leading to policy, and those policies being fairly disastrous, led to a lot of deaths. Like, um, and then in the UK, I guess slightly more innocuous because it was fairly localized um, and nobody really died. Uh, people were so convinced that 5G gave you COVID or something, I'm not exactly sure sort of theory, um, set fire to these things in a couple of instances. So these are, I think, real life examples of the consequences that misinformation and belief in misinformation may have, right? Um, but a bigger concern, at least in the early stages of the pandemic, was, OK, does belief in misinformation uh, lead to, uh, uh, um, well, is it linked to decision making when it comes to vaccines, right? So in theory, what you would think is, well, if someone believes misinformation, they're less likely to get vaccinated. And so early studies, these are, well, early, but these two studies, uh, one by one by us, our lab, and then one by uh, LSHTM, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, both show pretty much the same thing, which is there is a measurable correlation between, an independent correlation between belief in misinformation about the virus and um, vaccination intentions, meaning not actual vaccination. Right, so that's a good indicator that we might have a bit of an issue in the sense that the more people believe misinformation, the more likely it is that they are uh, uh, not happy about getting vaccinated. But as all of you know, correlation does not equal causation. So we teamed up with these researchers, specifically Sergio Lumba and uh, Alexandre de Figueiredo, um, to address this question properly. And that's this one. Uh, this is under review at the moment at, at science, so we'll see if that goes through. It would be amazing. Um, so what we did was we wanted to check if misinformation belief is correlated with um, uh, actual vaccine uptake, not self-reported vaccine uptake, but actual vaccination rates. So we had a sample of maybe 16,000 people in the United Kingdom and we had, a, and it was a huge sample, and we had their postcodes, meaning we knew where, where our respondents lived approximately. And we also had a standardized instrument to measure how likely someone is to believe misinformation as a, uh, how do you call this, as a psychometrically validated test, right? And so what we found, which was the, well, the title again sums it up, uh, the better someone is at detecting fake news, uh, or let's say, I should have put it properly, the, at a geographical level, at a geographical unit, let's say a county or something, right? If that county had a higher average ability to detect fake news, right, according to the standardized instrument, vaccination rates were measurably higher in this county. And this association held up if you controlled for things like age and gender and education and voting behavior. Meaning, that's a big thing, I think. As a, as a general skill, how good are you at identifying whether uh, uh, something counts as misinformation, right? That skill being higher in a particular region is correlated with or predicts actual vaccine uptake, which for me means, okay, that means we do really have a problem. Meaning, we should, it's worth tackling this skill somehow uh, because that will, there's a very reasonable assumption to be made that that actually leads to uh, higher vaccine uptake. Okay. Great. Now, on to the next part of the talk. Um, all of that's well and good. Now that we know that there is a problem to a certain extent, and we have a bit of an idea about the scope of the problem that we're talking about and the definition of the problem that we're talking about. Um, 
there's a lot of research that has been done in the last couple of years, mainly since 2016, 17, into uh, why people believe misinformation. Because for me, at least, this informs our decision making when it comes to designing interventions. Right. So, um, the way you usually do this in psychology, you identify predictors of misinformation susceptibility. So a very famous one is analytical thinking or cognitive reflection test performance, right? Uh, one of the questions in this test is, um, uh, Emily's father has three daughters, April, May, and, and then you're supposed to give the answer. The intuitive answer is June, but that's incorrect. It's Emily because at the beginning it says Emily's father, right? Like that, that kind of question. So it's supposed to be a measure of, um, intuitive versus reflective thinking. And so uh, the work by uh, uh, Gordon Pennycook and David Rand argues that this is the most important predictor of why people believe misinformation, sort of a reflective open mindedness, I think is what they call it in their work. OK, so it basically means that if you run a test, uh, this score on this cognitive reflection test should be the biggest predictor of how likely someone is to fall for misinformation. OK. There's another body of work, which is uh, Jay van Bavel's uh, sort of theoretical contribution. Um, he argues, and some agree with him, that uh, it's not necessarily analytical thinking, but rather an identity. He has an identity-based model of misinformation belief, which is to say, um, people are motivated by accuracy to a certain extent. They want to hold accurate beliefs, but this, these accuracy related motivations can be overridden in some cases by identity considerations, such as political ideology, right? So that's that's Van Babel's model. Uh, the study that I showed earlier, uh, we found that uh, numeracy skills, simple ability to solve a math problem, was the strongest predictor of reduced COVID-19 misinformation belief in five countries. So that was a fairly consistent predictor. It wasn't that we had any sort of anything theoretical to say about it. I, I, I will be honest in saying that I'm not a theoretician. I don't understand theory very well. Um, but it's a yeah, correlation, so you might as well give it a, like, you might as well test it. And then uh, within the context of the United States, a big predictor is uh, political partisanship, specifically conservatism. So there's a lot of work that shows that in the United States, and I do want to specify in the United States because this doesn't hold up everywhere. Um, identifying as more strongly conservative is related to a reduced ability to identify misinformation across a range of settings. Like it doesn't, it's not necessarily a, um, how do you say this, a function of let's say the headlines or whatever it might be. It seems to be a pretty robust predictor in and of itself. And so we did a study recently where uh, we had the opportunity to test which of these factors, which of these models are the most robust. And uh, that's this one. So that came out in May of this year in judgment and decision making. We collaborated with uh, a lab at the Max Planck Institute led by Stefan Herzog. Um, and uh, it was a really nice study of one of the things that we studied was whether it matters what question you ask, right? So, uh, if you want to, to measure how susceptible someone is to misinformation, you can give them a bunch of headlines and ask them how accurate do you think these headlines are, but you can also ask other questions. How reliable do you think these headlines are? Are these headlines real or are they fake? Et cetera, et cetera. So there's a bunch of these questions that have been asked, uh, question framings, we call them. And then also response modes, meaning how many scale points did you use? Two, two or false, six, seven, et cetera. And so what we found was that, that the question you ask doesn't really matter, which is good, right? It measures more or less the same construct, which is really nice if you want to do a meta-analysis. But the other part of this paper was, uh, what are the most robust predictors? And so this is what we found. Uh, this is the figure from that study. Um, here you see uh, on the x-axis, um, open-mindedness score here, right? Um, AOT, meaning low, or low to high, cognitive reflection test performance, numeracy test performance, and political ideology, one being highly liberal and seven being conservative. And so a higher score here, it means a higher ability to discern true from false information or misinformation from non-misinformation, right? It goes from zero to one, almost nobody scores zero, but people do score one. And so uh, what you want to see is the, the, the 
steeper this line on average, here are the different sort of ways that we measure misinformation, right? The steeper the line, the stronger the predictor. And so what you find is the line for actively open-minded thinking is super steep, the slope, and uh, for political ideology is fairly steep, meaning we find that same association that conservatism is related to reduced ability to identify misinformation. Numeracy is okay, meaning it's it's fairly uh, fairly robust, but there's some flooring effects here, as you can see, because almost nobody scored zero on this test. And then the cognitive reflection test performance, the line is completely flat, except for one condition, but that that's not relevant. Um, so what that means is actively open-minded thinking was by far the strongest predictor of misinformation susceptibility, followed by conservatism. And again, this was done in the United States, right? Uh, then numeracy skills, uh, but uh, ideology, political ideology and numeracy were about the same. And finally, uh, cognitive reflection test performance. So what we conclude here is if you have a standardized instrument for measuring misinformation susceptibility, uh, and you test all of these different accounts alongside each other, the identity-based account wins by by a lot. Like the, 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 the classical reasoning account doesn't perform very well, uh, and that's also borne out by some other studies, for example, by Boruksson et al. Uh, from a couple weeks ago, I think, where they tested various models of misinformation belief alongside each other. Okay, so to summarize that, uh, of course, as is always the case, there's various factors that play a role in why someone falls for misinformation. And it seems to be that both identity and thinking style are usually important. And analytical thinking ability does play a role, I think, but a smaller one than we had originally anticipated. And then an underlying debate that I haven't really addressed here at all is, um, well, maybe there are simply uh, latent factors that predict or that are that explain all of this right and so uh if you're ever interested in having a really interesting talk with someone i would highly recommend leor zmigrod zmigrod uh who is a postdoc also at our junior research fellow here in cambridge and she works on something like cognitive rigidity meaning maybe it is sort of cognitive flexibility that underlies much of this and not necessarily uh identity and so on and so on. But that, I won't get into that. Uh, she's far better at that than I am, so I won't, I won't bore, bore you with the details. However, what I do think is um, because there isn't an exclusive identity component, it is not the case that people believe misinformation because they have a particular identity, right? It's a trainable skill, and that's uh, the thing that I want to discuss next, right? What can we do about this problem? Luckily, I think everyone pretty much in the field is convinced that misinformation susceptibility isn't a fixed construct. It can move, right? People can improve in this ability somehow through learning or in other ways. So I won't go into the details of what kinds of interventions exist because that would be too boring, but a very common one is uh, fact checking, right? And I think that fact checking, first of all, let me know if this is incredibly useful and tends to be very effective at correcting misperceptions, right? Uh, or very effective, but at the very least, uh, it doesn't backfire, and in some cases it works. But, uh, as we discussed before, it's not always so clear what the facts are, right? And it's much more difficult to fact check misleading content than false content, because you can't slap a label on it that says false. You have to be very nuanced, which means you have to take a lot of time, people can interpret it the way they want, etc. Um, Another uh, difficulty with fact checking, I suppose, is if someone believes misinformation, let's say they believe that the earth is flat, you explain, well, actually the earth is not flat, uh, it's round for reasons X, Y, Z. Assuming they believe you, right? It's not as if the effect is completely gone, meaning there's a residual memory of the misinformation that continues to hold some kind of influence, right? It, it resides in memory. This is called the continued influence effect, meaning the correction doesn't completely undo the misinformation in its entirety. Um, another issue is the illusory truth effect, meaning repeated exposure to misinformation increases its perceived reliability, meaning the more you see any individual example of misinformation, the more you're likely to believe it simply by virtue of repetition, but that's especially dangerous if the misinformation is coming from multiple sources, right? Uh, 
There's also the issue of source credibility. So one thing that I think is often underestimated is uh, you could fact check something, but if the source of the fact check isn't trusted by the person who believes the misinformation, they're not going to adapt. They're not going to adapt their ad change their attitudes whatsoever, right? Because they're like, well, there's some like I don't trust this person telling me this. So why would I believe you? Right? And then this last point I think is also often underestimated, but it's very interesting to explore this a little bit. So Fabiano Zolo, who is a professor at the University of Venice, uh, published this article in 2017, which is extremely interesting. And this is what it is. Um, it's called Debunking in a World of Tribes, worth a read. What she did was she looked at engagement with fact checking accounts on, I believe it's Facebook. And so here you have uh, the likes and the comments on um, fact checking accounts and posts by, by, by or posts by these fact checking accounts. Right? OK, what she also did was she identified two communities basically online, right? One community that is polarized towards science and one community that is polarized towards conspiracy theories. Now, that doesn't mean that they all, all the conspiracy theories only share conspiratorial content and the science people only share scientific content. It's more it's a it's a preference, right? OK, and so what you find here is very, 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 very obvious, which is to say the conspiracy community doesn't like or interact with uh, these fact checking posts pretty much at all. Right? And that's a that's a serious issue, I think, that is worth thinking about when it comes to debunking fact checking. How do you make sure that people from the communities that are polarized towards more misinformation, i.e. would benefit more from uh, being corrected, let's say that sounds very patronizing. I don't mean it that way, but I hope you get what I mean. If if your fact checks don't reach these people, are we really doing something very helpful, right? I mean, seeing from an objective standpoint, I would say yes, but maybe there's more that we can do uh, to increase engagement among different communities that aren't already sort of polarized towards science. OK, again, this doesn't mean that I think we shouldn't be doing any fact checking. I think we really, really should, but there are certain limitations that are uh, difficult to uh, uh, ignore. OK, now this was a very, very long story, but uh, and I hope I, I hope I haven't bored you, but the idea behind this story is that it sort of informs a lot of the decision making that went into why we designed the interventions that we've into that we've designed. Um, and so <laughs> we'd like to use this this quote. Um, if you're faced with this kind of a complex problem, it's probably a good idea that your own approaches are also a little bit flexible and inventive, um, as Professor Snape uh, pointed out in uh, Harry Potter. So, what we wanted to achieve to a certain extent is not instead, I guess I shouldn't have said instead, alongside debunking, uh, pre-bunking. And uh, I think this was a word that was originally coined by John Cook, um, who is now at Monash University in uh, Melbourne, in Australia. The guy who created Cranky Uncle, if you're familiar with it, really, really nice guy and really good at this job. Um, and the idea behind this is you want to reduce the probability that someone falls from misinformation in the first place, right? Which has all sorts of beneficial, hopefully downstream consequences. And the way that we've approached this pre-bunking idea is through psychological inoculation. And a psychological inoculation is basically a metaphor. Um, it's originally from the 1960s. So the idea is much like a medical vaccine is a weakened version of a virus, let's say, right? That if you inject it in the body, the body thinks it's sick, starts creating antibodies. So when you're hit with the real virus, you don't get as sick or not sick at all. The idea behind psychological inoculation is basically the same. If you preemptively present people with a weakened version of the misinformation that you're trying to tackle, right, uh, which you do by warning them initially, hey, wait, hold on, someone might be trying to manipulate you, and you preemptively refute the misinformation, that people might tell you X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z aren't correct because of reasons A, B, and C. Um, what that should do is trigger the production of what you call mental antibodies. There's no chemical that does that, of course, but metaphorically. Um, 
which then induces increased resistance to future exposure and persuasion attempts, meaning you already have a defense system that prevents you from being persuaded as much as you ordinarily would have, right? Okay, now what my colleagues Sander and van der Linden uh, looked at in 2017 before I joined his lab was, okay, can you use this inoculation idea to prevent people from being persuaded by climate misinformation? And so this is a, a graph from that study. Um, what this basically shows is the y-axis shows the shift in perception before and after um, about the scientific consensus about climate change, right? So the question was, how, how, what percentage of scientists do you think believe climate change is happening and is man-made, right? And so if the shift is positive, that means that it's just in the right direction. If it's negative, it means it's just in the wrong direction, meaning people end up believing that the scientific consensus is less than it actually is. And so if you tell people 97% of scientists uh, believe that climate change is real and is happening, their shift in perception goes up by quite a lot. If you show them misinformation, this was a, a petition, the Oregon petition, it's called fake petition about uh, like climate scientists or scientists supposedly having signed a declaration claiming that climate science is false. That shifts their perception in a negative way which is a serious problem. If you present both the misinformation and the simple facts side by side, there's no shift whatsoever, which goes to show the power of misinformation. And then, so these two are the important ones. If you provide a general warning, partial vaccine, right, with a partial refutation of the misinformation, that shift in perception goes up, meaning there's a partial recovery of the original simple facts effect, um, even if you show people misinformation. So that's good. And with a full vaccine, this recovery is even more. With full vaccine here, meaning you debunk, pre-bunk, I should say, pre-bunk this misinformation petition by saying, well, it was signed by, like there was no, no access barrier, meaning people signed this who had no idea what they were doing, uh, meaning the Spice Girls signed it and Charles Darwin supposedly signed it and Charles Darwin, you know, dead. So, uh, that is a good proof of concept of uh, the ability to, the, the power of using inoculation to prevent people from falling for misinformation. Of course, it's not 100% effective, but then again, we all know that the COVID-19 vaccine isn't 100% effective at preventing people from acquiring COVID completely, but it is very effective, right? Okay. Now, that gets to the heart of our research program to a large degree, which is, that's all well and good. But I can lie much faster or spread misinformation much faster than the entire audience can fact check me, right? Uh, because it's simply like there's an asymmetry in terms of how much effort you have to invest. Which means it, with inoculations, if you design an inoculation for every single example of misinformation, that might be useful in limited circumstances, but it also uh, limits you because there's a scalability issue. So what we've been doing is, okay, what if you identify, as I mentioned before, several common misinformation techniques or manipulation techniques, such as emotionally manipulative language, conspiratorial reasoning, trolling, logical fallacies, etc. meaning techniques that we know are common and that we can define as manipulative or misleading according to, for example, formal logic or in other ways that are reasonably objective. And, and the advantages of such an approach are that uh, it's source agnostic. You don't have to tell people this source is good, this source is bad, which runs into issues of distrust. You don't have to make a truth claim, which is very useful because oftentimes people dispute what is and what isn't true. And in some cases that's fair enough. And in some cases it's just sort of being obtuse. Um, and it's more scalable as I mentioned before. Right. Now, the metaphorical syringe of this inoculation, right? Like there's many possible syringes. You can have a piece of text as in my colleague Sanders study from earlier, um, but you can also create a game, right? And so, that's the idea, right? Like the method of inoculation is, in this case, playing a simple game that you can play online. So we have three of these, uh, Bad News, BadNews.com, Harmony Square, and uh, Go Viral. And Bad News is generally about all sorts of misinformation. Harmony Square is about political, electoral mis- and disinformation, I suppose, and Go Viral is about COVID. Um, how does that look? One of these games, so this is basically what it is. Um, each game consists of a couple of levels, and in each level, 
you learn about a particular manipulation technique, meaning you learn how to use it or how it's used in uh, online environments. So first you pick an avatar, evil genius, uh, Carmen San Francisco, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a bit, a bit of um, baking soda. Um, if you pick a name, that's your character. And uh, here you see that in Harmony Square, the point is um, you're hired as a chief disinformation officer and um, your job is to sow discord on Harmony Square, right? And you learn how, how political operatives tend to exploit polarization, uh, tend to uh, increase sort of intergroup distance and so on. And um, that's uh, how, the, uh, how the game sort of teaches you how you might be manipulated. And then how does that work? This is a, an example, just one example from a recent study. Um, if you ask, if you assess how susceptible someone is to misinformation before playing and after playing, what you want to see is that they're less susceptible after playing. You can also do this with a control group design, which we've done many times, uh, but just to give you a simple illustration. And so here you find that there's a significant reduction. These differences are significant from 2.58 to 2.22, right? The perceived reliability of headlines. And for real news, meaning non-misinformation, that production is far less. There's a bit of a debate about that, but at the very least, the idea is that people become more discerning of what is manipulative content, what is not manipulative content. Just to summarize that body of research, um, if you play one of these games, that means that there's a reduced perceived reliability of misinformation. Uh, people become more confident and they are less likely to indicate wanting to share misinformation with others. We've also done some longitudinal studies um, and these uh, effects are significant for a week or more, depending, uh, and longer if people are given short reminders or, or booster shots. Right, so those are the games, uh, but there's a problem with some of these games or with all of them really, which is they have an opt-in barrier, meaning everyone... Um, uh, has to make a decision and a commitment to play the game. And so that means that you have to make the games entertaining and so on and so on. But even if you make a very entertaining game, which I'm not sure you've done, uh, the vast majority of people is never going to want to sit down and play it, right? So we collaborated with Jigsaw, which is a branch of Google, uh, to expand on this idea, meaning we wanted to create some short videos that can be shown as sort of public service messages or ads on video sharing platforms, right? Uh, and here you do the same thing. Each of these videos explains particular known manipulation technique. Uh, these are the five that we've um, created, emotionally manipulative language, fear mongering, incoherence, false dichotomies, scapegoating, and hominem attacks. And uh, what you hope to see is that people who watch one of these videos are uh, better at identifying these techniques in social media content. And so let me check the time. I should have some time. Uh, this is an example of one of these videos, and do let me know if uh, you can't hear the sound. Um, here we are. You might think about skipping the sound. Don't. I can't hear the sound. Is the microphone on? Uh, it's audible, we can't, right? it's audible, right? Can't hear the sound. You cannot hear the sound. Oh, okay. Annoying. I don't know why that is, but so I guess I'll just skip it. But either way, I'll put the link to the website in the chat. But for those of you who are joining uh, non-virtually, the link is www.inoculation.science. Uh, that's the website uh, that's added all of these uh, articles. Nonetheless, so I don't know why that's, it's always really annoying with uh, these these kinds of things that for some reason they don't um, project sound properly, not so sure. So we did a, a series of studies, about seven in total, that I'll discuss uh, about this. And this has just been accepted. It's not online yet, but it's uh, we have the DOI, so it's, it's, it's there. Um, and what we did was we ran uh, six lab studies, one, one for each video and then one replication for one of the videos. And we wanted to figure out, okay, do people actually improve in their ability to detect these manipulation techniques? And that's the case. They're more confident. Uh, they, they, they consider social media content that is manipulative, meaning makes use of these manipulation techniques to be less trustworthy. And they're less likely to be willing to share this type of content with other people. And I'm happy to get into the study design of that, but we're very confident about these conclusions. 
But uh, this is a really important problem within the misinformation research space, I think, which is this. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this article. It's super interesting. It's uh, by Stefano Della Vigna and Elizabeth Linos. And basically, this is the thing that they did. They tested um, uh, lab studies about, in this case, nudges, right, against field studies when these nudges are actually implemented in real life. And what they find is, it's underlined here, um, if in the uh, lab studies, the average impact of a nudge is very large, about 8.7% point uptake, 33% uh, whatever, increase over the average control, which is nice. I mean, I don't know exactly how to evaluate these numbers, but it doesn't really matter. In field studies, they, they still call the effect sizable and highly statistically significant, whatever, but much smaller at 1.4 percentage points, right? Meaning it's reduced by a factor of six, four, depending, it isn't entirely clear. Uh, but at the very least, the impact is much smaller in field studies compared to lab studies. And that, for me, what that means is you need to make sure that the interventions you design start out with a good effect size in the lab like a ro very robust one, because otherwise you simply don't have enough effect size left when it's finally implemented in real world environments. OK. So luckily, the effect sizes that we had uh, in the videos were uh, pretty good. Not not uh, well, not the world's greatest effect sizes, but good enough that we were confident that there would be something left. And what we had the opportunity to do was run a completely ecologically valid inoculation campaign on YouTube. Meaning we had two of these videos, the one that I tried to show just before, the one about emotional language and fear mongering, and the one about false dichotomies, right? If you're not with me, you're against me type thing. Um, and we showed uh, hundreds of thousands of YouTube users um, these videos as ads, or one of these videos as ads, right? And uh, Within 24 hours, this isn't exactly correct. I should update this description. Um, within 24 hours of watching that video as an ad, they were also shown a single survey question, which was, here's a headline. Can you tell me what manipulation technique, if any, is being used in this headline? Right? And so there's four answers that they can give. One of them is correct. And so we also had a control group, which didn't get the inoculation video, but they did get the survey question. And we had uh, three of these headlines or items per uh, video per study and total n of about 22,000. And these are the results. Uh, this gets really complicated, but at the very least, this is the number that is most important to pay attention to. Um, on average, the treatment group was about 5% to 5 to 10% more correct than the control group and highly, highly significant because it's not significant as if it's at zero. So you can see this item one didn't work, but the other items, except for this one, which is very, very close to being significant. Um, work like a charm, meaning in this completely ecologically valid study, we found that you can reduce susceptibility to misinformation, improve someone's ability to identify misinformation techniques, not individual examples of misinformation, misinformation techniques, um, even in an environment that is as noisy as YouTube. So we're very happy to see that, meaning that this effect is so robust, uh, even if you implement it in, a, in an environment like that. So that's pretty much the end. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much, but um, what I have wanted to talk about is, uh, well, first of all, how to define misinformation isn't exactly easy, right? Uh, which informs some of our design choices. What is, what's true isn't always clear, and manipulation is more common, it seems to me, than false content. Um, there's a variety of reasons why people believe misinformation, which include identity, my side bias, and to some extent, analytical thinking ability. And luckily, uh, it seems to be the case that misinformation susceptibility is a movable skill, meaning it can be trained. Um, this is something I didn't really discuss, but it is certainly true, which is I've talked about susceptibility and reducing susceptibility. What's far less clear is to what extent you can change behavior, right? Meaning can we design, let's say, psychological interventions that uh, have a measurable impact on the amount of stuff that people share and amount of dodgy things that people share online. Unknown so far. Um, and some of the work that we're currently working on 
is uh, number one. Can misinformation exposure influence the results of an election? That's a very interesting study. More on that later. I'll have a lot more to say about that in half a year or so. And another one is because so much of misinformation seems to be related to polarization, bias, open mindedness and so on. Can we leverage those insights to reduce polarization on social networks, which hopefully has downstream effects that we think might be interesting? All right, I've talked a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to answer any and all questions, thanks. comments, uh, criticism, and so on and so on. So thank you so much. Great. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for interesting um, talk. Uh, you touched upon a lot of topics that are very interesting for what we are doing as well. Um, let's start with having a discussion. Somebody uh, wants to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, you, you might need to speak up. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Nicholas from Poznan University of Technology. Thanks for the talk. Uh, during your discussion about the paper uh, titled Ability to Detect Fake News, You've mentioned that you are using your own uh, standardized tool to measure the susceptibility to misinformation. Could you please yeah. share words about the, how this tool is organized? What are those uh, the principles? How how does how do you measure the susceptibility? So uh, this is a project that was led by one of our PhD students, Raccoon Martens and uh, Friedrich Götz at the University of British Columbia. Um, uh, and, and the idea yeah. behind it was um, you need a psychometrically validated set of headlines um, uh, that people have to rate in some way, right? True or false, let's say. And what we did was we used GPT-2, which is a natural yes. language sort of generation algorithm. We fed GPT-2 a corpus of a bunch of false headlines, and we asked it to spit out about 400 headline examples that it considered to be false, right? And we had we started out with about 400 uh, true headlines as well, which were taken from normal yeah. sources like Associated Press and so on and so on and so on. So that's our starting set, uh, headline set basically, which we then through a series of iterations whittled down through sort of psychometric testing, um, uh, response theory and so on and so on, to 20 headlines in total, um, uh, 10 false and true, and participants rate each of these headlines as true or false. And the nice thing about this is that there's a lot of psychometrics behind it, meaning we know that each individual item is interpreted the same way by left wingers and right wingers, for instance, uh, and by men and women and so on and so on. Right. So you don't uh, the, the, the interpretation of the headline is the same, and which means that the problem like you're you're getting it correct or right. wrong means the same thing if you're a liberal or conservative. It's, it's item response theory type thing gets very complicated. Um, so took a year and a half to design the damn thing, but we're pretty convinced that it works now in that way, in the sense that if you take this test, you get a particular score, right, or a series of scores, and these and scores these... are pretty indicative of a skill. Not, It's not exactly like an IQ test, meaning it doesn't work as an individual performance metric, but it does work as a group level performance metric, right? So you can very safely say if group A performs better at this task than group B, that means that group A is better average on average at detecting misinformation than group B is. Right? That's that's a safe conclusion to draw. It doesn't mean that if I take the test and you take the test and you take you are better at it than me, that means you are better at detecting misinformation than me. You can't say that, just like with IQ, it's sort of the idea, right? If you have a higher IQ than me, that that has certain and certain connotations for intelligence and so on. It's very tendentious, I know that, but that's the idea of an IQ test. This isn't exactly the same, but it's, it's the closest thing we have, uh, if that makes sense. All right, thanks. Right, questions? Yeah, I, ha I have one question. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, uh, Alex from the University of Oslo. Hi, Alex. Uh, so, uh, earlier in your talk, you were talking about that conservatism was one of the most robust predictors of susceptibility to misinformation, right? Uh, and I was just wondering, yeah. I was just wondering uh, 
what what kind of misinformation did you sort of present for those individuals? Because uh, not that long ago there was a paper published which showed that sort of the both extremes, uh, both extreme left and right, tend to score higher on conspiracy mindsets. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So I was just curious, what kind of misinformation did you present to, to the participants? Oh, it was the same psychometrically validated test. Okay, so it wasn't yeah. like. Any, yeah, we were very careful not to have um, uh, 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 the items themselves be biased uh, as much as possible. Yeah, and we, we checked for this in a hundred different ways also because the editor of the journal, John Barron, uh, is super nice. He made us check this a hundred different ways to see if we we're not wrong. Um, you know, we're fairly convinced that it isn't, it isn't uh, a function of the item set that we find this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, John, I, I have a question um, that kind of relates back to uh, the question you asked whether misinformation is a problem. And uh, you talked about these effects in the domain of health, uh, which I think are really negligible in terms of the size. Uh, we, we published a meta-analysis in current opinion where we see that I think 1% of health behaviors explained by conspiracy uh, beliefs uh, longitudinally. So uh, correlationally, effects are bigger, like you said, but but they're very small longitudinally. Uh, so so my question is, um, what what other domain what other domains do you think are most affected by uh, misinformation? And um, co connect to that question. Um, if we take the perspective of those who create uh, misinformation or have a motive behind it, what motive do you think they have? Why? Why? What is the function of uh, misinformation from their perspective? Sure. Um, I think, I think uh, politics, for instance, is a very common domain, right? Because uh, there's a very clear outcome to identify that 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 benefits from spreading effect misinformation or disinformation which is you win an election let's say right uh, there's other considerations that go into this as well right for example uh for some it's beneficial if people hate each other a lot and by which i mean for instance with the russian disinformation campaigns going on in the united states they these disinformation campaigns play into sort of societal pressure points with the goal of increasing animosity, right? Now, there's a yeah. goal behind that, which is paralysis, meaning a country that hates itself or where people hate each other aren't, isn't a very effective country, meaning politically speaking. Um, and uh, on top of that, there's a financial component to it, meaning the Fox News, let's say, but also MSNBC to a certain extent and other outlets, they, they rely on sort of generating outrage or playing into outrage to a large extent for their business model, right? You see the same, it's not a new thing. We see the same with the yellow press, right? Uh, clickbait isn't exactly a new phenomenon. Simply now you uh, sells. Therefore, there's that component, meaning misinformation is often outrageous, let's say, uh, novel, um, generates some kind of interest, right? And, and that means that, that means there are sort of certain strategic benefits uh, uh, in terms of reality, but also in terms of potentially sort of political consequences and so on. Uh, does, uh, does that answer your question or did I, did I miss something? This is a question and I find it very interesting. I mean, you, you, you came with an example of Fox News, which is obvious. That's showing that mainstream politically centered uh, institutions such as Google um, cooperate with a lot of fake news web pages in terms of uh, ad ad placements. Well, that's, that's also a very interesting um, uh, point. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. So I think we can move on to another question. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, hi, John. Paweł Wierzyński from Jelena uh, University in Krakow. Um, so, uh, we did um, a systematic scoping review uh, comparing different kinds of interventions, um, amongst which uh, we also uh, was reviewing your work. Uh, 
so thank you for that. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> doing some classification work, and we are in, in uh, right now in the in the uh, process of reviewing. And so there were some doubts from reviewers. Uh, that um, we uh, first of all we used uh, Lao Vu uh, definition, which is like this umbrella term for misinformation, which for instance is uh, cyberbullying as a, a kind of misinformation. So my first question yeah. is, if you uh, would agree that kind of misinformation, and second of all, uh, we also included some ways of countering uh, cyberbullying. Um, which mainly was was uh, videos um, yeah. informing uh, cyberbullying. Uh, so I'm very happy to see that you just uh, tested this uh, uh, intervention videos because uh, I thought uh, it might be perceived as a kind of inoculation, and I tried to uh, sell it uh, as such. Would you agree that it's a good classification or not? Thank you. Um, for the video, it would depend on the content of the videos because the it's not not every video is an inoculation. I would say, uh, meaning inoculation is a fairly specific procedure in that it follows this preemptive warning, preemptive refutation approach, right? Uh, so, I if it can be reasonably said that these components are present in these videos, then then sure. If not, then it's maybe more akin to media literacy, let's say, or something along those lines, right? It gets very muddled, this whole thing about definitions and what is and what is an inoculation and so on, but sort of that's sort of the, the anchor that we tend to use. Um, is cyberbullying misinformation? Uh, yeah, that gets really complex. I guess it's more, it's, it's harmful content, I, I think, right? But you're not, Really, like there's no explicit sort of manipulation component necessarily, right? There, there isn't. I don't. Ne not necessarily. There can be, I guess. But if if it's sort of you uh, being mean to someone online, you're not really trying to manipulate them necessarily, right? You're you're just being mean or trying to make them feel bad. So, I think that's sort of the distinction, I suppose, that I think is is useful to draw. Uh, does that help? Does that, I guess it makes it worse, doesn't it? <laughs> many, no. Many. <laughs> I imagine that uh, the kind of cyberbullying that is misinformation is uh, you take somebody and uh, tarnish his or her, her their name, right? Uh, you, you spread um, false falsehoods about them, rumors, things yeah, like yeah. that. So, so the, this this uh, that way, or, or it might be on a, a, a racial background or a sexual background, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you see this uh, that way, that, that might be kind of a misinformation. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, the example you brought uh, probably is not. Yeah, yeah. that's the thing. I mean, cyberbullying is an umbrella term, just like misinformation is. So you're basically trying to determine where the two uh, umbrella terms overlap, I guess. Right? Right. Thank you. It is and so in some cases it does and in some cases it doesn't, I guess. And maybe that's a, a, a decent way to describe it. Uh, meaning if it's sort of two teenagers yelling at each other online, it doesn't really count as misinformation. But if it's um, uh, deliberately spreading sort of rumors about someone, well, then it would it can be set all under the same category. Yeah, makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Hi, this is Rafa from my Institute of Pharmacology College, the Academy of Sciences in Krakow. Thanks for a beautiful talk. Uh, I have a question because you mentioned there are these two components, the affective and cognitive component of vulnerability to misinformation. And I was wondering whether you could identify some basic cognitive mechanisms or you know affective processes which could be uh, targeted, for instance, uh, um, when when countering misinformation, whether on this basic level one could imagine some sort of uh, intervention. Yeah, it gets extremely complicated. Like I, I sort of alluded to this this role that might be played by cognitive rigidity. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But that yeah. isn't some that isn't necessarily a trainable thing. thing. So uh, you don't think that cognitive flexibility could could be a factor in? I mean, I mean it could be. Uh, this is a completely unknown territory. I don't. I've never seen research on this. I've, I've also told that I'm not the most 
voracious reader in the world, so it's very likely that I might have missed something. But to my knowledge, uh, I don't. I haven't seen anything that goes in this direction. Uh, same with like open mindedness, right? Like this idea of reducing my side bias. There's a lot of literature on debiasing, but it hasn't really been very well connected to the literature on misinformation and misinformation susceptibility. Um, like there was some thought uh, a while ago that maybe sort of generally um, training sort of a general, I guess, cognitive ability in some capacity, whether it be through solving math problems, or whatever, might be might have sort of beneficial side effects in terms of reduced susceptibility to misinformation. But I'm not so sure about that. That seems very tendentious, to be honest. Um, because once you start talking about this problem from a very cognitive perspective, which might make sense, but you're also immediately going to start talking about other related issues. You're, you cease to talk about misinformation and misinformation susceptibility alone. You're talking about a whole bunch of other things. So it gets very complicated. I'm, I'm not a cognitive scientist myself, uh, so I, 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 would, I would not feel completely confident having a, a lot to say about this, at least not yet. Okay, and the, 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 like, sorry for the follow up. Uh, how, how do you place this misinformation, vulnerability, and general, uh, well, in the light of general vulnerability to information? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, vulner some, vulnerability to information is, is very broad, right? Uh, uh, vulnerability implies something negative, meaning so sensitivity, vulnerability, vulnerability to persuasion, perhaps, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it gets gets incredibly complex. Um, I think, generally speaking, here we're only we're not only talking about individual differences, but we're also talking about the structure of social networks, the extent to which the, our use of social networks informs our opinion making and decision making. Um, what's the role of echo chambers? What do, what does it to you when you're constantly online and in these environments where outrage is sort of whipped up constantly, right? Regardless of, let's say, cognitive ability or cognitive vulnerability, all these kinds of things. So my, my general point, I suppose, which is also something that I've been trying to say in discussions with, um, I guess, policymakers and so on is, we should be wary of considering this only or mostly a psychological problem. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily very helpful because that allows us and especially people like Mark Zuckerberg and so on to evade discussions about the responsibility that social networks have when it comes to uh, what kind of content people consume and the consequences that that may have. By which I mean, there's a real possibility that Twitter is making us angry, right? Let's say. Uh, and we know for sure that these kinds of outrage driven algorithms are beneficial to engagement and therefore um, you can sell more ad space and therefore you can make more money. So what I don't want is for Twitter to say, oh, we're just going to inoculate everyone and pre-bunk whatever else, right? And that's also a problem. Why? It's cheap and it doesn't require you to reconsider your business decisions in any way, right? And so I'm not so sure if it's such a great idea for Twitter to be dodging that responsibility all that much, which it's it's easily done if you focus too much on the psychology of the problem. Even if I do think that, for example, these interventions are effective as far as the psychology of it goes. Uh, that doesn't mean that I think that is all or even most of what we should be doing. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Uh, you, you talked about it and there is a lot of work showing that uh, misinformation has to be understood from a partisan perspective. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering, um, I'm going to try to um, formulate this as a provocative type of question. Um, Given that the effects are pretty small, right, of most uh, interventions that exist to date, um, what about the flip side? What about um, 
the effect of such interventions uh, for people who are, let's say, more um, or who perceive this uh, inter these interventions as part of some activity targeting them. Um, mm -hmm. Have you? Do you have any any results showing kind of resistance effects? Um, people who are, I mean, the, the the best case is people are not reacting at all, right? That they, they don't move after um, after an intervention. But some people might also be pushed towards the extreme. Um, at least that's what we see in other types of psychological phenomena. So do you have any um, insights in this regard? Um, yeah, so the, the Science Advances paper that we're publishing soon on the videos, uh, one of the things we did was we ran a really large number of moderation analyses to see if the interventions work less or not at all for people of different, like uh, like across the political spectrum, across different levels of misinformation, susceptibility for different levels of open mindedness and all these kinds of things. And the answer is that like there isn't really like there's a difference in effect size, but it still works sort of by and large with very few exceptions. You find significant differences between the treatment and control group across all sorts of different groups, which is good uh, because I do think that it matters because we also published a few papers earlier on like moderation effects in, in misinformation interventions. For example, accuracy nudges are moderated by political conservatism in the United States, meaning they don't work very well for conservatives. They don't work very well for liberals either, but they don't work for conservatives especially. Um, so uh, that's a that's an issue, right? Because you don't like, I mean, that doesn't mean that therefore you shouldn't be doing any accuracy nudging. Um, but it does mean that you should be aware of the limitations, I think. And so here we we were trying to really be sure that this there isn't a meaningful moderation effect going on. But that only tells you one thing, right? That only tells you is someone from a particular group, uh, do they still benefit from the intervention if you ask them to do an item rating task, let's say? And the answer to that is pretty clearly yes. But that doesn't mean anything about uh, for uh, uh, reactants, right? So what you see now a lot is this politicization of fact checking, meaning uh, within the context of the war in Ukraine, this happens a lot, right? Like there's, um, in this case, I guess, sort of Russian telegram groups doing fact checking of Ukrainian news or Western news, etc. And the point of that isn't honest, an honest appraisal of sort of the reliability of information. It is part of the information war. And other than that, you also see people who are generally just very skeptical of fact checkers and any and all fact checkers and even the word fact checking. And so I don't think theoretically there's anything preventing pre-bunking or whatever to uh, be, be be vulnerable to that kind of thing. Of course, that might happen. You can politicize anything you like, right? Um, the best way to avoid that, although you can never avoid it completely, is to, at least in my view, avoid making truth claims because those are always disputed, uh, but also make the interventions, make sure that the interventions are sort of entertaining enough um, uh, a little bit sort of against the grain, maybe, right? Not uh, patronizing at the very least. Um, and and hope that it remain, remain, retains some, some, some benefit. Um, but I'm not under the illusion that uh, there is no way that, like that this intervention is the holy grail, that this will work where others have failed. Nah, of course not. There's always going to be people who simply don't want to engage with the intervention and therefore it will be ineffective for them. And that's that will always happen if the intervention is voluntary. Um, and even if it isn't voluntary, like introducing a are you sure you want to share this button on Twitter? Like a lot of people are simply going to be like, yes, right? They might use it once or twice the first time. And they're like, oh, yeah, right. I should be I should think about this. But after 100 times, are we sure that that effect is the same? My guess would be no, probably not. So you always have to deal with this problem uh, if you're designing interventions that aim to tackle a psychological component or a behavioral component, such as the nudges. Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, I think it's very promising that you don't find that political orientation can flip the the size of the, the valence of the slope. I mean, that's that's at least uh, promising that that it doesn't. Well, let's say push very conservative people um, more into into the direction of believing in misinformation. So that's that's great. Um, I think that's at least 
damage control finding. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the best we can do, really. That's that's, that's it. it. Uh, at the very least, you want the interventions to be effective, broadly speaking, across groups, in the way that you measure it, right? But that doesn't like that says nothing about exterior factors such as how right. someone reacts to being shown the intervention in the wild. So what about those who are believing quite strongly in in misinformation? Um, are they a lost case? So with respect to the inoculations, they're not, this is important to note, they're not tools of persuasion themselves. They are intended to prevent persuasion, uh, unwanted persuasion. So if someone is already persuaded, that's the same as does a does a COVID vaccine help against someone with who's in the hospital with COVID? Right? You do break the doubtful. Oh, that's Sorry, but you do try to break the circle. So any new misinformation should be blocked to some extent, right? Um, for, for people who are open and amenable to learning from the intervention, yes. Um, so I th I do. Th it's not that I would say that people who are very firmly convinced that. Uh, 5G gives you COVID and they fully believe this, like they, they're not going to necessarily benefit from playing a game, even if you force them to play through it, right? It's just it's too much to ask of an intervention that's that short acting. Um, I don't think that's that you can expect that because we know that that's also you also almost veered to the territory of like de-radicalization and the de-radicalization literature is very different from the inoculation literature in the sense that de-radicalization tends to involve a lot of effort. And so I, I, I don't I think that the interventions have the power to achieve that. It would be way too optimistic. You know, I would, I would just be sort of, yeah, I would feel like I'd be selling snake oil if I said that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? I don't think we have any questions. Yep. So uh, you, you mentioned um, these uh, accounts that spread misinformation about uh, COVID-19, which are right now uh, um, switched to uh, war to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, you, you said something around their lines that there's um, um, artificial component to it. So, so, so you believe um, the uh, accounts are not or orchestrated by uh, some political forces uh, or is it is it some uh, uh, random uh, AI doing this? Uh, what, what are your thoughts about this? It's, it's very bizarre uh, to, to see that there are some accounts that just do uh, misinformation and uh, it's, it's very to, to believe that uh, nobody orchestrates that. No, I, I do think that there's orchestration behind it, but it's difficult to prove that. Um, um, like we know, know, for instance, about uh, the troll factory, oh, yeah. right? In St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. a very famous example of um, um, only automated accounts, but also people being hired to yeah. spread misinformation effectively. Um, um, it's up in the air as to how effective that is. That I don't know. The literature seems to show that it's fairly minor, but who knows? Um, but I'm also not, I, so it's simply true that states use online environments for disinformation and Russia is one of them, but so is China, Iran. I'm sure the United, the United States is up with something too, right? As they usually are. Um, but the most high profile example is Russian disinformation. And um, like that, like these are campaigns, like these are uh, uh, paid for by the government. Um, uh, they are run by political operatives and they have political goals behind them. And so the strategies that they use are partially automated, I would say. So partially these are bot accounts, partially they're not automated, etc. Uh, so what's interesting about that for me is that apparently it's also completely content agnostic. So it doesn't care about like, these disinformation campaigns don't necessarily talk about Russia all the time if they're Russian, right? They're not like Russia is great, the West is bad or something. It is a bit of that. But the point, like if the point of these accounts spreading misinformation about COVID isn't to make some kind of point about Russia. It is to get as many people as possible to believe misinformation, at least share it, uh, so that you have to spend time tackling it. You have to spend time in discourse and political discussions talking about COVID misinformation. Um, 
and so on and so on, right? You have to can be concerned about the extent to which these this misinformation affects vaccination rates, all of which takes time away from other things to be talking about. And also uh, you're, you're sort of trying to fuel some kind of discord, right? You're trying to get the vaccinated and the unvaccinated to hate each other as much as possible, for instance. Yeah, there's one more question. Uh, so if uh, if you're searching for an anecdote about uh, human uh, element of troll farms, um, uh, there was a, uh, a story that reverberated through Poland about uh, a group of accounts, supposedly Polish, writing in really decent Polish language, but all the time referring to the Americans as Yankees. <laughs> 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 does, but it's popular uh, in Russia. The Russians really do call Americans Yankees. So these bot were telling them these are this and that and that and that and writing this in Polish and someone saying, look, Vanya, this. <laughs> don't do that. It's you who do this. <laughs> but my, my question is, you mentioned that one of the uh, techniques uh, you found uh, useful was to teach people about the mechanics of of the misinformation and yeah. teaching them through, yeah. through gamification of, of how that may work. But mm -hmm. also, you now mentioned there are uh, kind of uh, meta narratives uh, employed by countries where each campaign serves a greater purpose of some political strate strategic goal like chewing uh, discord in European countries or trying to to in, uh, increase the, the the doubts about the European project and so on and so forth. Would that make sense also to try to teach people or show people uh, pr particular instances of this information as agents of this larger meta goal of this large narrative of mm -hmm. us versus like East West, uh, you know this. Uh, liberal, uh, free for all, do what you want attitude versus we are the moral uh -huh. true uh -huh. humanity stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that in principle you can leverage inoculation theory for this purpose, I think. Uh, it's just a matter of testing how effective it will be, right? But I, I do think that sort of generally pointing out um, the extent to which the, like, the individual examples that you might see about Ukrainian refugees uh, behaving badly, whatever, right? Like that these individual cases are inconsequential in, in principle to the general larger meta narrative and meta point that is being made, right? Um, I think that is incredibly useful to do and, and I do think that there is a deficit in knowledge in, in that regard uh, with many people, including, you know, like how would you know this if you didn't like, read analysis articles about it, right? You never would. Uh, and so I do think that you can leverage inoculation for that purpose. I think that would be useful. In fact, that's also why we've applied for this uh, research grant, which we're hopefully receiving some some good news about soon, uh, to specifically sort of tackle these kinds of strategies that are common in 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 this particular disinformation discourse, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, right? Because that seems to be especially like a, a hotbed of uh, uh, disinformation in many regards that relates to East versus West relations, but also values, right? LGBT is one of them that is always being exploited, but also women's rights and so on and so on. Right? So, uh, yeah, I think that would be incredibly helpful for sure. I, I have uh, two questions, so um, maybe uh, at the be at the beginning, one which refers to maybe uh, some intervention. Have you? countered or have you thought about possible of interventions which are not focused uh, on uh, say on, on the content uh, uh, of that appears on social me media 
but rather on the general culture, how we use our our phones for for <laughs> for instance. Because there are some 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 theories that let's say wherever there is a technological uh, re revolution and a new uh, device appears, we as a as a, as a human species, as a certain culture, we have to learn how to use it in a way that is not harmful for us. So do you think that that it's also some some uh, some scope for or for change? So yeah, we sure. have... there's there's cool work there's... being done by many uh, researchers. Okay. But an example that I think is usually worth mentioning is the civic online civic. Uh, stuff that they do at Stanford. So people like Joel Brickstone and Sam Weinberg and so on. Uh, it's more, it's much more media literacy than inoculation, really. Uh, but it's very interesting where they like the 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 point of that curriculum or those lessons is in, to make people more aware of like, how social media works, um, how to how to do lateral reading, how to do your own fact checking, these kinds of things, right? And so, so that is much more aimed at at the sort of teaching people strategies to navigate online environments in a more beneficial way, I suppose. So there's a lot going on in that direction. I think that's that's helpful, again, as part of this sort of broader spectrum of, of solutions that are being developed. And my second question is about, you told us about your ecological study that you did with, with YouTube and in our scoping review uh, one thing that we realized uh, but we stopped let's say uh, we we collected on, only data to the meat of uh, 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 so we had just the papers that were published till the mid of 2021 uh, and we realized that there is only a few studies which which could be called ecological and m most of them are are conducted in the lab. So, yeah. uh, what do you think are the the biggest obstacle to 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 construct uh, this kind of more ecological uh, studies from your perspective as a mm -hmm. as a uh, costs and cooperation from social media companies. Like one of the things that I'm very angry about is that this YouTube study cost forty thousand dollars to run, right? And we were lucky enough to work with Google, which owns YouTube, so they paid for it. But it's in, in principle, it's bizarre that there's such an access barrier to begin with. Right? And so we really had to like work very hard to get agreement from YouTube and Google to do this, uh, which is insane to me. It, it should be completely democratized, uh, meaning I think every researcher who works for a, a university, let's say, should be given access to these kinds of materials and this kind of study opportunities. Um, because right now, the simple fact is that this ecologically valid study, which I think I agree is the only one that I could find at least that was uh, an example of an actual misinformation campaign that you can run on a social media platform. Um, it relies completely on one team in a way, right? Which is insane. That's not how science should work. It should have everyone should have equal access and hopefully arrive at the same conclusions. So there's a lot to be done in terms of, I guess, gently asking is one way to do it, but another way would be forcing social media companies to open up this kind of access, not only to the API, but also to ad space and so on, um, uh, to make doing this kind of research a lot easier. So I think that that is an incredibly important step. Uh, the fact that there's so many barriers to entry for these kinds of studies is, Unjustified. unjustified. Okay, uh, I guess that is it for today. Thanks a lot for joining us and answering uh, all the questions. Thanks for the patience. Um, it was very interesting. Do you have any concluding words or? Oh, just uh, I want uh, also to thank uh, all of our par participants and yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for your uh, your questions and your participation.